Barbara Gabriel's going to give is responsible for the next session, shall I say? Barbara is going to talk for about ten minutes. Not quite that. Well, here five minutes, or maybe five. another 10, 15 minutes. And then we're going to have a general discussion. It's open to the floor. Neither Barbara nor I will be actively driving this discussion. It will be, it will be open to the floor. And Barbara will say some words at the end, some closing That's remarks. Correct. Okay? Right. All is understood? <laughs> okay. Bye. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I mean, all, all that came because uh, I am a physicist working in materials, not terribly active now, but along the way I became, became involved in Zen and eventually I became Zen master. And that actually caused a bit of trouble for me because suddenly <coughs> people took interest and they were uh, asking me one question. How can you reconcile being the master and the scientist. And it's just, there is no conflict whatsoever. What are you talking about? But I was invited to a conference of philosophers. And after that, I gave interview. I had interview with China Minutes. I'm sure you never heard of them. Neither did I before the interview. But they, they made this recording, which I present to you as conclusions of of the discussion and then over 10-15 minutes I will develop certain points that I would like you to to have a framework for discussion. So let's let's start. We are looking at a different way of looking at time and space. In Zen, what you uh, aim to is to get rid of the feeling of, uh, of time and space. You go in the place, I cannot express it otherwise. You go into a place where there is no time, there is no space. And it's quite different in science because the scientific inquiry has no place outside of time of space. It may be shorter time, longer time, smaller space, bigger space. But it is always very well defined. If it's ill-defined, we can't uh, conduct the inquiry. And so if you look at it from sort of slightly different point of view, it's like in Zen you have unification. Because you are becoming one with the universe to, uh, to express it that way. There are many ways of expressing it, but that's the first one which I thought of now. And in, in science, you are always somehow outside. I know there are, uh, there, there are uh, trends in, uh, in quantum mechanics which say that the, uh, the presence of observer influences the, the subject, but uh, the subject influences the object. But this is not on the macroscopic scale that we can that, that we can observe, and that's why again the importance of time scale is quite important. And that also means that the way we pose inquiry depends on the discipline. Science is not homogeneous. There are very many strands of inquiry. The questions that a biologist can ask himself or herself is very different from the that the, the physicist would pose. So we have this big fragmentation. <coughs> there is not such a thing as uh, the general theory of everything. That's a dream of uh, every scientist, but it's not possible, it's not feasible. What do they have in common? Uh, the, the, what I see they have in common is they have methodology of inquiry. Because Zen can be described as dialectic pragmatism with religious basis. So if we leave religious basis for a while, Dialectic pragmatism is very important because it means critical approach. It means also that it's practical approach. And that's actually what science is about. So they have this common platform there. And also attitude of the questioner. In Zen we have maybe more spiritual way. But in science we also have to include ethics into our, into our inquiry. 
So that's where they, they truly, uh, I would say, not quite merge, but they come very close together. There is a way of asking questions. Uh, in, in Zen, the, there is a question which is called the great doubt, which is actually the great wonder. And that's a question that every serious practitioner will ask himself or herself. Who am I? It's one way. What is life? Where did I come from? Where I go? And in science, it is maybe a different question, but it depends on the discipline. In my discipline, there would be more specific questions like how do, how do molecules move? How, how, are the, uh, how is matter ordered? So, but it is still a question. If you don't pose yourself this question and you don't want to, to solve it, you cannot make you, you cannot make progress. So you have very similar point of uh, a, a inquiry. You have the very similar starting point, and then there is another uh, similarity which is called the great trust. And uh, in Zen, it doesn't mean you trust what I'm saying. You have to find it yourself, but the trust is that there is a way which supports you. And the same it is in science, because you don't work in vacuum. You, your work is based on the work of others. So what you implicitly trust is not just that it is good, because you have to question it as well, but you trust that you have capacity to query it, and you trust that others have capacity to query what you have achieved. So that can be within the science declared as the temporary proof. And for both, you need great perseverance. It's, it's very, especially in the early stages of some training, it can be very, very frustrating, and there is big temptation to give up. And it's the same with science. I mean, more often than not, we, we hit the wall. The nature doesn't want to work how we want it to work. So it's important not to quit, it's important to have the perseverance. Yeah. Okay, so let me just try to get out of there. And just very briefly, very, very briefly go through several points so there is more to discuss. And actually, uh, it's just a story. And that's my journey. Your journey might have been different. But uh, I believe that we all search for the truth. And it's not necessarily the religious truth, I want to say. And I was walking two different roads. And I had mountain paths and valleys and bushes and, and rivers. And name it, I had it. And they eventually became one. So, where we are? There is just the only place that Zen recognizes as the point of where that's our Earth. Of course, it is in the universe, but we can only question something which is here and now. That's what I really liked about it, the, 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 the instant, not speculation about the beginnings of the universe or whatever. And so, looking from the point of view uh, of classification, we can't truly put Zen into any box, because it's not philosophy in the meaning of the Western world. Neither it is religion in that meaning. I like the definition of who is naturalized, which is definition of the Flanagan, and that means that this is Buddhism, but stripped of all magical uh, elements. So there is no karma, there is no supernatural beginnings. It's just the sort of down-to-earth ethics. And so that's how we search for reality. And if you look at the photograph, you can see that we don't always see the real branch. We can see its reflection, we can see its shadow, and only when we lift our eyes, we get fuller picture. And maybe this is still not the complete picture. And a religious basis makes lots of people uncomfortable, but I assure you it doesn't come into this inquiry. It's simply the great wonder which makes you having 
and that's science. It is fragmented and it's a matter of scale. And I always felt bad being just material scientist because it's not really sort of cool, you know. You have magic, uh, uh, magic major fields of inquiry like particle physics, cosmology. That is really something. Yes, you ask big questions and so on. And I'm just sort of humble, modest person working in condensed matter physics. And that is really not. And it wasn't until I found an article by Anthony Leggett that I felt vindicated. Yes! Condensed matter physics is very wide field. It's now, you know, about biophysics. And it actually covers very large scale and we can ask questions about life. Maybe not origin of life, but we can ask questions of life, about matter, how the things fit together. And I would like you to read the definition um, of Zyman. So, I mean, this is something which made me realize uh, it's a very good book, actually. It's an old book, but uh, Zyman has, has really thought about what science is about. Because if you try to, if you try to make, I, 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 can, leave, I can give you this presentation, no problem. Uh, I was trying to think what the hell science is, and I couldn't find the answer. Nobody ever told me how, how, what is science and how you do it. And I really would like to, to throw this question to the audience later. Maybe you are better on that field than me. And the basis is methodology of inquiry. This is the basis of my comparison. And I was looking for commun commonalities because obviously we all like to live comfortably. We don't like to have a conflict. I know scientists who are Christians and they have big conflict with their belief in God and what they observe. I'm, very, I'm in very com uh, comfortable position because there is no personal God in Buddhism. So there is no question about, and, the, uh, and if you look at Buddhist cosmology, well, okay, the cosmos is there, it always was, and it is changing, and it always will be, so why bother? So that's really good. I'm, I'm making very sort of, very raging <laughs> simplifications. I'm sure that, that you can understand that. But what do they have in common? Critical examination of facts. They have acceptance of the impermanence, but impermanence what it is of what? Of all phenomena. And this is becoming really interesting because we know from science, at least the science I've done, that everything changes. All the, uh, uh, all the molecules are in constant motion. And somewhere I have in my brain that all molecules in our bodies change every seven years. That there is sort of blueprint which, which keeps me going. But there is also in, in Zen there is no permanent self because it is always changing. It's all, always changing. And also the important point is non-reliance on scriptures. If you, if you, uh, if you talk to somebody um, we, we don't have scriptures, of course there are sutras, but what does it mean? It means I cannot take the word for good, I have to experience things myself. And if I have students, they shouldn't believe what I'm telling them. They have to find their truth themselves and I can only guide them. So that means non-reliance on, on scriptures. And if you think of decent science, it's pretty much the same because you've got to examine the facts critically, whether it is experimental or theoretical science, doesn't matter. You have to be critical and you have to be able, there is difference because here you have to be able, in science you have to be able to repeat experimental theory. And so then we have three grades there, as, as I, I said there, so grade out of wonder, where do I come from? For me, it was what is beyond life and death, was my personal question. And I'm still, you know, you, you ask these questions all your life. You don't, you don't just stop because you graduated with a certificate. Great faith. And again, people misinterpret it. The faith is not in somebody's word. The faith is that I have capability, that I am able to walk the way that others have walked that there are people supporting me, 
but I have to do it myself. I always talk about do it yourself then. So that's the fate in this sense. And great perseverance, I think it speaks for itself. And in science, in research, great doubt will be essential questions. In my case, it was how do molecules move, how, what is the structure. I, I, I've been working with polymeric substances. Now it is no no because those are plastics, but all right. It's nice to know how they are built. Great fight is in methods and uh, the way of inquiry. And I think implicitly we could throw here the, the faith in the scientific community. Normally we don't talk very much that science is not, uh, that, that science is the, well, human enterprise. And, and if you know, don't know, I don't know your particular histories, but in my case, I've been working with somebody and we put quite a novel ideas and it was 10 to 15 years before they were accepted. And we are very highly criticized and that is very good. This is how the science works and that's how it should progress. So faith in methods, but also criticism from, from the scientific community. You have to be able to prove uh, I can't say beyond doubt because everything is models and hypotheses, so what is the doubt there? Objectivity. Uh, I may have my favorite theory, for example, but I cannot say this is the only good one, right? And this is very hard because we all have our little, you know, favorite. Reproducibility, that's something which, which uh, makes a big difference with the uh, with spiritual practices because by their nature they are not reproducible and they, they cannot be shared. One of the masters, uh, Shin, uh, Shinryu Suzuki Roshi said once, oh, you cannot you cannot share with uh, somebody even a fart, let, let alone the spiritual experience. So, and great perseverance. Okay, and that is somewhere where I would like to stop. Maybe just sum up what I said, and then we can switch off the machine, and I would like you to engage. So let me just sum up what we said. Zen avoids language, that's another difference. Science has many languages. I mean, if I listen to, to lose lecture, after five minutes, I'm probably completely lost. If I listen to somebody's lecture who is who is in quantum mechanics, I will be lost very quickly. I have a bit more training there, but whatever. So we need to know the language, we have to speak the language. And so there are truly parallels rather than exact mapping between the two approaches. And actually, those of you who remember the 70s, there was this uh, book by Percy Zen and the Art of Mot Motorcycle Maintenance. And that's exactly what we actually do in science. We work on self as a scientist, and that's completely compatible with Zen practice, which has more of the psychological angle. And actually, it's, it's a sweeping statement, the last one, but it's possible to find the meaning of my existence and by extension of human existence to the combination of both approaches. And uh, that, that brings, I can't say it brings happiness. Uh, I mean, what, what does happiness mean? But that means certain, that brings certain contentment. I'm doing fine, you know. Uh, I'm uh, where I am. I'm no longer there. It works itself. So that is all what I wanted to say for now. OK. Yep. Right, so the floor is open for you. Can, can you start, start with? Yes, I mean, the chairman is there. Yes, yes but I'm having a very light touch. If you have questions, to be, can I answer? Um, like, but it, it's a comment about science uh, first. Um, it's interesting to me uh, to look at, at the same questions you're talking about, about science in general, in the context of doing uh, mathematics, where the 
the criteria are a little different and yet very much the same because when in doing uh, mathematical science, what is required for the agreement among colleagues is maybe a little more rarefied than it is in regular science with its experimental side. Mm -hmm. uh, the only commitment is, uh, I, at least internally, it looks like the only commitment is clarity and rationality. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, the further commitment is to speaking those languages of logic and clarity and rationality that are common among so if one investigates in mathematics new languages having to do with expressing rationality or clarity, then, uh, then one might go a long way in, in, in a kind of isolation uh, attempting to create a way of, 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 of teaching others that language which one has come to believe uh, is a workable language because one is actually in the, in the process of creating Language. Yes. Well, physics is much more messy. Yes, mm -hmm. I'd like to um, say a lot of things, but I think I'd like to start with um, trying to express and see whether there's agreement about what science actually is, because I thought that didn't come up in what you were saying. And um, it's something that I've noticed as well about having discussions also with other scientists, this is a point which people often argue with, so I'll just go for it. Speaking to a group of scientists who don't speak English as a first language, and don't have an article, in other words, don't have words for the and an. One thing I came up um, against was saying, was explain to people what the scientific method is. Now, there is only one, and the means there is only one. Yes. And first of all, it's quite dis diff difficult to explain this. And, and people, people disagree and say, there are loads of scientific methods. There are hundreds of scientific <laughs> methods. There isn't just one. There's yes. my scientific. Your scientific method is different, as a matter of opinion. And this is bullshit. There is only one scientific method. And that method is that thing that has created the world that we live in today. The people in ancient Greece, the Aristotelians, were not stupider than we were. They're not different to us. They're just the same people. They were at a level of technology which was more advanced than in Leonardo da Vinci's time. And yet, 2,000 years later, the world had not really advanced and hadn't developed science because the scientific method had not been invented or used. And then it was. Somebody came along. We don't know who that person was, except it was almost certainly Leonardo da Vinci. And this person was ignorant. He was desperately uneducated. He didn't speak Latin well and he had no Greek. He wasn't part of the circle of scientists at the time and was not accepted. But he found a way to find a method of finding, of investigating the nature of reality by doing the thing that we now call the scientific method, which is by coming up with some bullshit. I think it works like this. Mm -hmm. And then comparing what a bullshit he'd come up with with trying to find an experiment to test that theory. To try and test whether or not what he was saying was in any way, shape or form close to the truth. Not the truth as told by an expert or another expert, but the truth as represented by nature, which I could call the Zen nature, by the real nature of underlying reality. That process has continued since about 500 years ago building and building and building again, being carried by magnificent minds who die and pass it on to people. That process is something which exists not in any one person, but amongst all of us. And it has built the situation where we can fly, where we can talk to mum by picking up a mobile phone. This thing talks to my mum, look at it. It's a piece of rock. You do not find these things on the beach. They don't appear in nature. They only appear because of the ideas which have gone into thinking what's at the front end of those things that makes them work. Now that scientific method is that thing which has created this thing which is not any one of us, it's not understood by any one of us, that's obvious. I mean, I know more about physics than almost anybody else, except for some of the people in here. And 
and, 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 and yet it's absolutely nothing. I'm continuously astonished at how little I know about how much other people can teach me about the astonishment of how much else there is out there in science, which is the whole thing. But that scientific method is continuing despite the fact that I don't understand it at all or that we don't understand it at all. It's happening amongst all of us in terms of a search for the truth through looking at the nature of reality by not saying, this is the nature of reality, but by saying, reality, what do you think? Over to you in terms of experiment. And that process is the one and only thing that is science as opposed to philosophy or religion or art or any of other really beautiful things, but they are, that is the distinguishing feature for me of science. And I'm very happy if anybody can tell me why I'm totally full of shit here. I'm going to go for it. No, <laughs> you're right, but I think you're missing something. Oh, great. <laughs> because we also have institutions. Oh, and, institutions. and I think oh, institutions right. have been critically involved in this process, haven't they? Yeah. Yes. Now, they're, they're also in some deep trouble right now. I think institutions have been critically important in, in slowing it down. Okay. I think you also want to add in the mathematical part, which isn't about experiment, uh, except experiment of thought against thought in the face of rationality and reason. And, and it took a long, uh, a long history of experimenting uh, by people like Euclid and, and others to find that it was possible to develop scientifically mathematical structures. I could not agree with you more. Yeah. You're right, I didn't say that. But that is and reasoning structures, which, and those reasoning structures are then yes, inculcated with the, the experiments. Of science. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree, that's something else. We, we, absolutely. As we've developed, we've developed languages of mathematics, and those have become far more sophisticated. Sometimes that language of mathematics, a good example of this is the Dirac mathematics, have to be invented in order to take, or another good, a better example is calculus. Newton had to invent calculus in order to be able to think things that otherwise couldn't be thought, had to develop the language, the language of mathematics. That process is utterly critical. And this is summed up in Hilbert's sixth problem. Hilbert's, Hilbert's sixth problem. Did anyone? I've forgotten. Okay, Hilbert, Hilbert, was, a, Hilbert was, a, was a, one of the greatest mathematical minds of certainly the interface between the 19th and the 20th century. He was challenged to and produced a series of unsolved problems in mathematics. In, in, in 1903 or 1904, there's some discussion about precisely when the list was, was formed. But anyway, there were some 23 or so questions then, which were open questions, which were unsolved questions in mathematics, of which all but six have now been solved. Either the solution has been found or a proof has been found that there is no solution. So, so there are still six unresolved. One of those is Hilbert's six, so the six is one of the six unresolved. Hilbert's six problem is finding that mathematics which precisely describes the whole of nature just and no more. In other words, that logical system, where it may not exist at all, of course, but nonetheless, the challenge is to find that precise mathematics that exactly reproduces the whole of reality in every single respect, in such a way that it describes everything that does happen in experiment, but doesn't predict anything that doesn't happen in experiment. These are both important. So we have lots of mathematics that report E8 as one of them to describe everything, but they also predict lots of things that just aren't there at all or aren't observed. There are other mathematics which are very simple, like real numbers, which don't, which, which have an analogy in many aspects of reality, but that don't, that one can prove, for example, can't describe quantum mechanics. You need to have at least complex numbers to deal with quantum mechanics. So you need at least a level of complexity in the mathematics to even be able to think about that. And that mathematical level has been becoming more and more sophisticated. But it has also become, well, Hilbert's comment in 1903 was, the mathematics is getting too difficult for physicists to understand. And that was true then, and it's more true now. We, I... You could add mathematicians as well as physicists. Absolutely, mathematicians are all in there. These guys don't understand their own maths, let alone other people's maths very often. And these guys, I'm talking about me, or any one of us, we, we develop mathematics that we don't fully understand. Yes? Sorry. Um, Anything else you'd like to say something? Yeah. Um, 
I'm partly you want to support what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1962, Kuhn produced this book, mm -hmm. the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and in 50 years later, it was republished with a chapter at the front. And the chapter, as far as my interpretation of it, was as follows. Science has within itself a process to adapt the scientific method. And other ologies, philosophy maybe, and others, don't seem to have that capability. And when we go to institutions, then we need to say more, right? Now my question is this. Um, Kuhn also introduced the word paradigm, paradigm shift. 36 different meanings, I believe, yeah. or something like that. Now the question is, with the understanding of reality at the moment, if we say the non-believers of science right now say it's all about physical things, or maybe fields, but there's other non-physical things, mm -hmm. is the scientific method itself applicable to go that deep? I think that there's a huge problem. I think 50 years is a good time scale for that problem. I think there are branches of science. Science kind of fragments, just as you said. We go into these fields, and the fields become smaller and smaller and more and more con concentrated. The saying, of course, is that people know less and less about more and more until at some point everybody knows everything about nothing at all. So, so, but I think the, the break point for the point where people began to confuse themselves with their mathematics was roughly 1950, at the end of quantum electrodynamics. Now, at this point, we came up with a theory which was still calculable. You can calculate stuff in quantum dynamics rather well. That's where I broke my um, mathematics and doing this sort of thing back in the 1980s with some quantum dynamics calculations. You can still calculate stuff with that theory. But that then spawned a set of theories which are at the two edges that Barbara was talking about, at the edges of science, where there are theories which one cannot calculate with. These theories are then not subject to the scientific method. Because if they can't make a prediction, they cannot be proved false in any way. So you have these things which are now called science, which aren't science anymore, because they're just made up shit that can't be tested. They're religions. Well, this is cross boundary kind of thing. Let's call a spade a spade and speak of string, string theory. Absolutely. Where, <laughs> Uh, the physicists who work on string theory would insist of the serious ones that they're doing physics, uh, but they don't know how to uh, relate it with experiments. A mathematician might look at them or even go to one of their conferences and say, well, this is a, um, a feast of mathematical stuff, and uh, uh, I can think of this as just mathematics, and go on developing it with them, uh, but I'll think of it as just mathematics. The boundary between just doing mathematics and, and doing physics is blurred here. You're right. Now, it's always blurred a bit. A mathematical physicist is going to go off and do some mathematics, then they forget that it has to supposedly have something to do with experiment. I don't think they forget. I think they love it. Yeah. Because what you have is the problem with a very good theory is it can be destroyed by a very simple experiment. Right. However, if you can make your maths immune to experiment, then nobody's going to destroy it. You can publish away, you can have a complete career in this, you go to lots of conferences, and nobody's ever going to be able to prove you wrong. Correct? Right? Well, so, so, so I'm, I'm worrying now about the scientific method. Yeah, Is so it part of the scientific method? Let's assume that it's part of the scientific method that there should be something called experiment and something called theory, mathematical or otherwise, and that, that the scientific method is much about going back and forth between these and getting agreements that it and was. finding agreements. It, was. it certainly was. Yes, until um, 1950. Does that assume, that doesn't have to assume that there is a world out beyond the practitioners who uh, are getting this agreement to happen uh, in any form of world other than world that they are creating or finding. For themselves, yes. But I think the original uh, I, and then there I don't know about the epistemology, whether if you go back far enough, that notion that it's, uh, it's operational in the sense that I said, where does it come in and where does it leave? At the moment, we, most people are, are thinking operationally. They aren't going to start 
declaiming that the world is such and such that we are objectively looking at. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think that the people are not going to claim that, and that would not be a right thing to complain, uh, to, to, to proclaim. Um, it, but you may have an axiomatic view of how things work. However, imagine that you actually want to engineer something. You want to do something that's going to work. It's going to fly. It's going to produce some new, sh new stuff which, you, which humans are going to use, which is going to take human progress forward. There are two kinds of theories. One is that you can use for thinking about reality, which then give rise to objects which exist in reality, in, in, in Popper's third world of, of where ideas become reality. Those kind of theories, you can listen quite quickly, they are such things as Newtonian mechanics, first of all, nearly always good, makes cars go, explosions, firepower vehicles, great things. They are quantum mechanics, which works at a deeper level in terms of thinking about the kind of things that you and I do in solid state physics, where we think about the quantum mechanics of molecules or of systems, that's a useful theory. There is kind of at the limits of this also um, quantum electrodynamics, which can be useful in terms of laser systems or in terms of the quantum mechanics of emission absorption. These theories are useful theories, which you can use to engineer things with. Then you have a whole bunch of useless theories, for which there is no known application. This includes first and foremost string theory, but also Big Bang theory and, and, and uh, quantum chromodynamics in, in high energy physics. It includes any non-perturbative theory. Now, what non, for those of you who are not technical here, you can, you can have theories which are, um, which are um, differential equations, which, are, which have equations of motion, like Newton's laws or uh, el Maxwell electromagnetism, which have equations which allow you to calculate what would happen. You can have theories which are perturbative. This is quantum electrodynamics. If you try and do the calculation from first principles, everything blows up, you have infinities. What you can do is renormalize that to bring you to a system where certain of the things where it's blowing up around, in quantum electrodynamics, those two things are the mass and charge of the elementary particles which emit and absorb photons. You can say, okay, well, okay, in the theory they're infinite. What we'll do is we'll calculate to some order. The infinity is not infinity, it's 10 to the, nine, 10 to the power of 96. So what we'll then do is we'll divide all our numbers by 10 to the minus the power of 96, and then we'll get the right answer. <laughs> and you get the right answer for those two things, you get the right answer for everything else. These are perturbative theories, so you can still calculate them. But then you have non-perturbative theories, which includes any kind of gravitational stuff um, in the limit, so black holes, for example, non-perturbative, or uh, includes all the string theories, every single damn one of them, can't calculate a damn thing with any of them. Uh, quantum chromodynamics, same thing. Um, the conferences, the theoretical conferences you get for these things, they say, oh, a search's coming up, we're gonna do some new measurements. We predicted the stuff is gonna be around 10 to the minus 42. But it could easily be 10 to the minus 46 or 10 to the, 10 to the plus 25, with these huge range. How are we going to explain whatever they come up with? And then they come up with, they say, and they say, yes, okay, well, the gauge shouldn't make any difference because you have gauge invariance, but actually it does. But we won't tell the experimentalists this. But in this scenario, we'll do this, in this scenario, we'll do that. And then they're ready, when the new results come out, to say what the theory was they all thought of in the beginning, despite the fact they actually had a very, very wide range of possible things they could have done. This is what they do behind closed doors, because quantum chromodynamics can fit a spastic hamburger. You draw them a picture, they'll fit it. It's got 50 free parameters. This is, this Any, is, anyone else? Yes. Um, I, I was just um, curious about this relationship of the sciences and mathematics and, and thinking about logic and reasoning. And, uh, and the word inquiry that, that you use. Um, and of course, uh, you know, something lit up in my head when I read, when I saw the word inquiry, just thinking about David Hume and inquiries concerning human understanding and, um, and how, you know, even Spencer Brown, for instance, the way he writes out the proofs, and of course, we might have seen demonstrations of, the, of modus ponens. Uh, when he's writing out the proofs, he's still using a form of reasoning that's very much like modus ponens, that you know, we talk in the same way, and this whole notion of proof yeah. is somehow in language, or it's somehow an empirical thing, that, that this sort of uh, logic that's employed, and I feel like there's a shared sort of ancestry with regards to mathematics, uh, mathematical method and, uh, and scientific method with regards to the assumptions of causality or just like, you know, 
um, a, a kind of relative of this modus ponens that we are we often use when we're trying to prove or point at something that's saying, yeah, this is what I saw. And um, so that was something that I was thinking about. Uh, and also, in the same work, uh, Hume's, uh, he talks about miracles, and I know that we're talking about real, and, uh, and magic is not part of that, or illusion is not part of it. And um, But somehow there's something uh, uh, and, and of course maybe that's a more focused topic of discussion to draw parallels uh, but uh, I'm wondering if you know uh, dreams and you know uh, and some sometimes illusions that they are there is a I don't, know, I don't know how many people in this room think of psychology as even a form of you know inquiry of some kind but there is a, a uh, I mean, there's something to be said there about, uh, you know, the, the sense of wonder, at least, that, that we were talking about in the connection with that. Yes, okay. Yeah. So, um, yes. <laughs> um, quite a lot, really. Uh, hey, so, yeah, to, to, to follow on from you and, and also bring up this, it was a question that, that you put, Barbara, um, in terms of uh, internal science, or yeah, so science of the mind, science um, that sort of yeah, what is our what what is our knowing? Well, what 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 can be our our, our spiritual knowing? If you like? what, um, this is, I mean, interestingly, this is something that obviously was that this. I mean, the Renaissance, the end of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance was a huge change. And there were lots of things, as you say, that with the, so that and, and as with any change, usually there are lots of good things that come in, and then there are lots of not so good things, and there are things that needed to be left behind, and things that were a bit of like babies that were thrown out with the bathwater. And um, so I think personally, I, you know, I'm very interested in you know some of the babies that got thrown at it, and. Um, I love babies. I says it all. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, just the, I mean, the, just the latest. Uh, there's been lots of things that have been coming up in the conversation. I thought, well, what about this? What about this? Um, the latest would be in terms of causality and thinking about teleology. So interestingly. Um, Someone was mentioning Aristotle uh, at some point, um, going back to Aristotle's physics, yeah. um, and people having looked at that, and, and also going back to obviously yeah, the whole thing about and the, oh no, was it you were talking about as well about the ancient Greek mm -hmm. technologies, um, teleology. Oh yes. Yeah, so, is to do with the goal, so that that was part of that way of thinking, so that we it's you know we can think in terms of causality. You know, you, basically causality is a way of thinking about time in terms of what pushes us, and teleology is thinking in terms of time and what pulls us. And you know, um, for example, you know, St Paul's Cathedral wouldn't have been um, created if it wasn't just pushed up that there had to be an idea that then pulled that together. And this, I mean, this relates in a way also to what, you know, Peter was talking about intuition. Now, up until the Renaissance, there were, um, you know, it, it was understood that there was a way of reflecting, you know, of working on one's internal state and of actually coming, learning, yeah, learning about one, the, the other kind of space, which, you know, psychoanalysis, which is a whole, which is another whole universe. It was, who was it? Yes, you, so Andrew had his thing up about universes don't love you, universes love other universes, well, but we are all universes. Um, I'm a cranial psychotherapist as, as well as a, um, a mathematician, a would-be mathematician. And uh, 
and you know, you 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 know, uh, there are you know these billions of cells, and they are all intelligent, and so you know, bodies are are universes, you know, amazingly intelligent universes. Um, so to kind of like just to, to, to kind of complete on this particular area. Um, it, there were people, so Roger Bacon, I think, it's very interesting, mm -hmm. the two Bacons, Roger Bacon and Francis Bacon. Mm -hmm. And Roger Bacon was very concerned with, you know, how do we actually research this, these other world, spiritual worlds, mm -hmm. and to be able, and also to be able to communicate, because I think, so we now have objectivity, mm -hmm. but I think we, it was actually, I went to a lovely talk by the guy, catastrophe theory guy, René Tom, where he was talking about intersubjectivity. And really, in a way, I mean, mathematics is, is you know, it's almost it's like, it's like a paradigm for intersubjectivity. Because, as you say, we, you know, as Lou was saying, you know, there are certain languages, you know, within mathematics, and of course mathematics is so huge, there's so many languages now that, you know, one speaking with, you know, from one math mathematical area to another, you, you, know, you get conferences where you know, it's like, uh, there's only about 30 people in the world who understand a certain area of mathematics. Um, but it's this, also this thing of create, to bring a new language, you need then, a language is of, of, of essence, communal. I mean, mm -hmm. when you have your private language, that, that is then, you know, well, as I would put it, between oneself and God, you know, mm -hmm. So the universe, cosmos, whatever, um, the great oneness of which we're part. And uh, so I, and I think, I mean, I think, so I think there's been a, there's been a problem for science in terms of not recognizing this, the, the possibility of this other world. And I think that's also a problem because you were mentioning ethics, and that, and I think this, the thing is that. There's been very, very little ethics, in fact, mm -hmm. in science. Mm -hmm. And in mathematics, it, it hasn't been recognized. I mean, it's only recently there have been sort of groups of people who start saying, how is our mathematics being used, you know? <laughs> um, what can we do about this? There's a guy up in Edinburgh who's, who's started a small, very um, And there is the question of the use of algorithms. Well, I mean, well, well, yeah. you mentioned it's very serious, but yeah, yeah, yeah. ignoring it. Oh, that's yeah. right. It, I mean, it is now, but I mean, this is this is this is now. This is now. It is coming in now. I think. I think we are at a very, um, you know, key time. Obviously, you know, whole things about climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think, you know, you know, Peter Marshall, I think, is going to be talking about this to some extent. And you, you were kind of being apologetic about. Using pl about plastic, using plastic, but I think it, it just, I mean, with plastic, it's a question of how is it used. You know, I've got a, there's a, a lovely friend of mine who's big into recycling stuff like that, and he was saying, you know, humanity at last found something that was totally indestructible, and what do they do? They make things and throw them away. Sydney would like to. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, can I just, I would like to say that. A lot of this information, is, this whole thing conference seems to center around an epistemological question. How do we know what we know? What is the source of our knowledge? Um, I can see a dualism here. One, we've got procedural knowledge, very, science is very good at answering how, and then we've got causal knowledge, which is answering why. And his, but given that whatever the history of why procedural or logical, I'm associating procedural with logical appearance, and just for, the, for argument's sake, why that it's, we're in an age where it's very successful and it's matured and, and, and been become very um, predominant in the conversation. So my question is, Peter's, Peter's theory can tell us how it happened, but it still can't tell us why. What kind of an answer do you want? <laughs> I just want to know. I just want to know. If you ask, like, why not? Well, you know, I mean, let's take a wide question. Why, why does this fall to the ground when I let it go? 
And then you have some nice answer about uh, Newton's law of gravity. And then you follow it with another why question. Why is Newton's law of gravity impressive? And now you're beginning to go into the quandary, right? And, but you will sooner or later, it seems, just go into a quandary because there can't be an endless uh, direction in such questions. Why not? The universe is endless. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, my case. Uh, something self referential or circular will occur. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important, but, but we don't understand it very well. Mm -hmm. but, but the question is a very good question. Yeah, oh, the why is an important question. But it seems like science is very good at answering procedural information. Yeah. How it happens. But I ask Peter all the time why does this structure exist? What's the point? He can't tell me. He's very good at describing the syntax of it, but he can't tell me why this universe has a multiple of one. Their own, I'm sorry. It might be multi multi pluralism. So, Everybody has their own so personal it, trajectory. It, I mean, it's interesting how different people have a, 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 play, a, a bottom line, right? Like, if you asked a was a form addict uh, line, well, what, what, what happens? They would say, well, Distinctions are happening. Mm -hmm. People are creating distinctions, or they're imagining that they're creating distinctions. Uh, Mark, and then you would ask, why? Mm -hmm. That's what I would ask, is why? One person might say to you, well, you can if, they, if they want to tell you, you wouldn't be able to observe, observe that. Mm -hmm. And okay. if, if you do observe something, then there would be a distinction. But you're, you found yourself off in the logical corner then. But it's interesting if, there was, if there was nothing, there would be no observer and there would be nothing to see. How do we know that there isn't anything? We were talking about nothing. But yeah, how do we know that I'm, I'm there just illustrating how, okay. how the why question is really something you want. Uh, usually you, want, you, get a, you feel best about it when you're in the middle. Why do things fall? And, and I, I, Understanding of it, but if I try to understand the why of that, I go into a deeper question. But is there a prime primary cause? Is there a first prime? That's there, what I'm there asking. May, there may be, and that's that, that's that's Hilbert's sixth question. We're talking in terms of the mathematics of understanding the why of things. So so, and that's an unanswered question still. Well, Hilbert didn't ask like a, about the why. The science question, seems to be yes. like a mirror. It just reflects the the physicality of everything that we're going for reproducibility. We're matching, we're testing our theories to see if they match. And it's a, a constant observation matching type thing. And But there's no real answer as to... The, the, the why is because we can't be, do it any other way. Because there can't be any other. That's the why. Let's imagine there is an answer to Hilbert's six. So there is a mathematical set of mathematical axioms which completely describe the universe we live in. So, you can, so, so let's say we did, could do that, and we could start with a, a set of maths which just describes quantum mechanics, quantum dynamics, Big Bang Theory, the origin of the universe, and everything. And we what we then ask hurdles and completeness theory. Exactly. So they, you then ask why that. So, so, so you come to a level where you're asking why of your basis. So if you have something which describes you and the whole universe, it's like a box which has a set of axioms. Then the completeness theorem says you can't look outside those axioms. So, so, so the thing is that when something is something which is looking at its own nature, and you get down to understanding the basics of that nature, then you can prove that you can't look beyond that. So at that point, the wine has to stop. Okay. Um, I think we need to be brief now. I think um, you have a quick. I do it very quickly. I, I, you, I just want to ask, and it builds on the, the algorithm thing. The effect that technology is having on the world of science is, is enormous now, and um, people are looking at um, incomprehensible um, manipulation of digital information and looking for proof, and, and, and actually useful things, but actually you can't really defend it in the same, it's not the same as testing a theory. And we're not controlling experiments in the same way that perhaps Roger Bacon might have actually suggested that we should control experiments. So, but this is blowing us up. This is kind of, you know, what was, somehow we've got to think about this. But the question then is, what is science? Is that Absolutely. Science? And then that's not science. So, so. Yeah, um, 
Well, going back to Mark's first comment about there's institution here, mm -hmm. institutions here, and uh, presumably there's overall s societal investment with an expectation of return on investment in various ways. Um, the question for me isn't why, which is probably not so easily answerable, but the question for me is who gets to decide yeah. where these investments happen and for what purpose? And, and the, I, the kind of, well, I, the, the idea that there's this one science is a very imperial idea, um, which um, sets up an idea of how society is run that is not necessarily in the minds of, not necessarily for the good. Uh, and that is a question that's worth in, in looking at. If, if our idea is to bring as many people into a state of ease and um, contentment and not, not dying due to starvation and that kind of thing, so that's right. Thank, thank you. Yes, Mike, you've got a for you. Um, you, you ended up talking about uh, your material science and your happy ways all going. We've been touching on the sustainability thing. One particular direction which has been hopeful for God knows how long is uh, nuclear fusion, right? Are you in touch? Could you give us a promise that we'll have nuclear fusion within our lifetime? I wouldn't put my head on my <laughs> but I agree with you. I mean, all the other, oh, we have exhausted most of the resources, right. or, or are about to exhaust all of them. That's the future. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay, That's last point. Well, if, if science is a system of knowledge, yeah, and if we take in answer to your why question, if we take Stafford Beer's assertion that the purpose of a system is what it does, then in a Wittgensteinian way we can exit the fly bottle, we can step outside of our self categorizations and ask, are we happy yes. with what this system is doing? Because we have sufficient resources now to solve all the problems on this planet. So why are we continuing to stay inside the flybox? Good point. Right, I think Barbara would like the final word. Yes, I mean, it's extremely exciting, the discussion. And um, uh, what, what I can sum up, we probably all can agree with, that science is very good in describing what it can describe within the limits that it, that it can have, and it has to be rational, it has to be reproducible. So that for me, it was always a question of limits. I'm comfortable with supernatural phenomena as long as somebody doesn't want me to prove them within physics, with using methods of physics. It's just orthogonal, we can't do that. Those are two different things. And it goes back to your why question, because in physics I can ask how gravity works, but I can't ask why gravity is there. It makes no sense within the physics that we know and so Maybe there will be sometime a formalism which will explain it, although I pretty much doubt it, knowing as physics as it is. There is a, a lovely story by Stanislaw Lem, who is a great science fiction writer, who says that mathematics is, a, is like a Matt Taylor, which makes all sorts of very strange coats and jackets and, and trousers with three legs, four legs, and, and physics is like the poor man who walks and tries to find something which would fit on what <laughs> <laughs> And I'm happy to talk, uh, to talk more, but, uh, but it's just, in this sense, we have no conflict between, be, between spiritual life and, uh, and, and sort of scientific life, because we just can't, you know, it's orthogonal, but it, it can be in the same space, so that's the... That was the conclusion I came to, and that's what made me feel comfortable and contented, because I'm not trying to move one method which works well in, in one domain to, to the other. Oh, thanks very much, Barbara, for your very interesting session. Uh, obviously, continue chatting afterwards, sure. but this is the end of the, <laughs> end of the formal session.